Okay, next, I would like to invite Kurt Larson to the stage to tell us about Abbas Ibn Farnas. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. I should have gone to that side. I've made an entrance. I just want to say before I say anything else that uh, we have monthly brainstorming meetings where we talk about what topics might be good. I don't go to all of them, but uh, Annette does, which is an example of how hard she works to make this whole thing happen. And at the last one I attended, which was for this event um, and one other, we were talking about human cannonballs, and our good friend Seth said, well, what's the history of this? I mean, before there were cannons, were there human crossbow bolts? <laughs> and that stuck with me. However, tonight we are here to talk about this guy. Abu el Qasim Abbas ibn Firnas ibn Virdas al-Takurini. Oh, no, that's easy for me. Trust me. Um, this is a person I discovered after suggesting this topic, innocently, with wide eyes, I discover is actually a figure of no small amount of controversy. But for the moment, let's just keep our eyes wide, an innocent attitude, and I will tell you that he is currently considered by many to be the father of flight, the engineer who tried to fly, the father of modern glider aviation, the first aviator, the first flying man in history, guy who plummeted a lot. Um, so who are they talking about? Well, they're talking about this guy. Right now my brain is calculating how hard it would be to just change this to a Batman talk. I'm about 10% short on cleverness, I think. <clears throat> Um, a man who lived in 9th century Andalusia, Spain. Uh, this would be Muslim Spain. This is around the time that the uh, Arab world had conquered most of Spain. And in the very south is the region of Andalusia, the cities of Seville and the area of Gibraltar and places like that. Um, he apparently, or supposedly, built a glider wing type device uh, made of silk, wood, and bird feathers, leapt from a hill near Cordoba, and stayed aloft for 10 minutes. You know, sometimes I wonder what people who are about 19 years old currently think about that trope when you say something and everyone's shocked and you hear the record scratch sound. <laughs> what, what does a 19-year-old imagine that sound is supposed to represent? <laughs> it's like when my 11-year-old asked me, what is it, why do they call it, say a phone is ringing? <laughs> so yeah, stayed aloft for 10 minutes? It's the only Arab ancient text I could find that said, wait what on it. <laughs> I challenge anyone to prove me wrong. <clears throat> I found this to be a little suspicious because A, wait what? <laughs> 10 minutes with a primitive glider device made by somebody who doesn't know how to hang glide and doesn't know how to make a hang glider and doesn't have access to any of modern materials. And, but then I really started to doubt this account when I thought, wait a minute, what would the concept of a minute mean to someone in the ninth century? People didn't have minutes back then. I mean, I'm sure they existed as an abstract concept, but you didn't talk about minutes or, God forbid, seconds. There were times between meals, sunrise to sundown. There were times of day, things like that. But you didn't say, meet me in seven minutes, Pedro. Very well, Father Assis, I'll do that. No. So I found this to be a little obviously cast from a modern perspective. So I dug further. What's really going on here? Let's go find the evidence, because I have the internet. Really? This is the best gag I have ever made. Come on. There you go. Thank you. Oh, Jesus, Kurt. The, the problem is that for a very, very long time, in fact, possibly even a time which continues now and into the future, there was really only one source for any information about Abbas ibn Firnas, and it was another Moroccan historian, Ahmed Mohammed al-Makari, 
um, who wrote in the 16th century, something like 750 years later. It's getting kind of thin. Now, al Makari is said to have used in his history works, quote, many early sources no longer extant. You have no idea what I could write with no longer extant sources. <laughs> Exactly, but in the case of Firnas, he does not cite his sources for the details of the reputed flight, though he does claim that one verse in a 9th century Arab poem is actually an allusion to this flight. I thought that was getting a little thin. So I looked into um, how people were actually talking about him, and I found that the length of his flight came from a single quote from this Makari guy who said, many witnesses said that it felt like 10 minutes. <laughs> now I'm sure that if I had never seen, heard of, or thought about the concept of a clock before, I might feel that way too, although I don't know what I would mean when I said minutes. This is a great example of internet info copying. If you look up Abbas ibn Firnas, almost every single account uses the exact same phrases. They're just, they're barely changed. It's like a bunch of high school students all sharing the same paper, as I'm sure you teachers in the audience can recognize. Um, however, recently, supposedly, this transcript was found, an Arabic manuscript copy of the Cordoban, Cordoban Court Chronicle, preserved today in the Real Academia de la Historia in Madrid, supposedly, apparently. And apparently, if you could read Arabic, which I can't, and I decided not to learn it for this talk, it gives a few more details that make it a little bit more convincing. So maybe this all did happen. Um, but what I really learned from doing this research is the whole story of Abbas ibn Firnas is now mired in deep, deep, deep cultural controversy uh, that has nothing to do with him or anything that he did or aviation or daredeviling or anything like that. It has everything to do with the political and cultural interests of the Muslim world versus that of the Christian world. Um, but Firnas is a huge hero in the Muslim world. Uh, the Libyans have a postage stamp honoring him. Um, the Iraqis have their airport. The Baghdad airport is the Abbas ibn Firnas airport. Uh, there's a crater on the moon named after him, that's true. A bridge over the uh, Guadalquivir River in Cordoba. Um, because he was rumored to have been covered in rich Corinthian leather. <laughs> I know some of you are old enough to remember that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but the worst thing about uh, this whole story of this guy on the internet is the reactions from the conservative Western cultures that for some reason uh, really don't want the Muslim cultures to make any kind of claims. It's not a friendly research environment because most of what you find is terribly contaminated by one extreme perspective or another. However, Firnas was in a very well-documented way uh, an accomplished inventor in other, in other ways, uh, not unlike da Vinci. Uh, he was a musician, he made a water clock called the Almakata, he devised a means of manufacturing colorless glass, he's a science book writer, invented glass planospheres, science! He made corrective lenses that were later, uh, at that time and later, called reading stones. He was a poet, devised a chain of rings that could be used to simulate the motions of the planets and stars, and a process for cutting quartz rock crystals so that the Spaniards no longer had to send their quartz to Egypt to be cut by the people who held the secret jealously. Aha. <laughs> There's a guy a guy who lived in the early part of Abbas ibn Firnas' life named Armin Firman, um, which apparently somebody drew this picture of him for some reason, despite no one has a clue what he looks like. This is a person who made a living by pulling stunts. He was described by a fairly reputable, reputable historian I was able to find as a, quote, daredevil, end quote. See, I connected it. Um, <laughs> But he's a person who made a living by pulling stunts, quote, he was no scientist. He jumped off a tower in Cordoba. He glided down to earth using a wing-like cloak to break his fall, and possibly as such that could be counted as something like an early parachute. Uh, supposedly, the young Firnas was there to see it. Um, 
Quote, he did not fly, he plummeted, but fortunately his flying contraption inflated just enough to slow his descent so that he did not fall at full speed. Possibly the world's first parachute jump. <laughs> However, what do you get if you Latinize the name Abbas ibn Firnas? You get Armin Firman. Almost certainly the same person at a different point in his life. <clears throat> Remember, there's very little evidence about this guy. So, the only thing I found that made me feel like I had actually arrived on something even approaching solid ground about this Icarus, if you will, was from um, a noted historian, Lynn Townsend White, uh, famous for his theories about how Christianity leads to environmental degradation. Not that I'm endorsing or disagreeing with that because I don't care enough to read about it. Um, <laughs> was writing about another possible early aviator named Eilmer of Malmesbury, and he said, and this is a great quote, no modern historian can be satisfied with a source written 750 years after the event, and it is astonishing that if indeed several eyewitnesses recorded Fearnos' flight, no mention of it independent of Al-Makari has survived. Yet, Al-Makari cites a contemporary poem by Mum bin Said, a minor court poet of Cordoba under Muhammad I, which appears to refer to this flight, and which has the greater evidential value because Mu'min did not like bin Fearnos. He criticized one of his metaphors. Whew, it's on now criticized one of his metaphors and disapproved of his artificial thunder. I don't know what that means. Although the evidence is slender, we must conclude that Bin Firnas was the first man to fly successfully. All right, thank you, Mr. Townsend White. The, the uh, matter is obviously settled. So, since we really don't have any idea what Abbas Ibn Firnas looks like, uh, I did research on my own, all by myself. I actually traveled to Spain and I found the descendants of the court artists under the, that same king, and they still had in their possession this portrait of Abbas ibn Firnas himself. <laughs> and so, I'll leave you with this, along with an invitation to become incrementally more drunk, <clears throat> by John Leanhart, the University of Houston. And I sit in awe of the nerve, the belief in self behind such a stunt. I sit in awe of the magnitude of the driving urge to fly that was with us long before even the legend of Daedalus and Icarus.